Good afternoon. Hello. Welcome to Pre-Calculus today. We are going to be building upon something we started to talk about yesterday with problem nine in our quick review. And solving this equation mentally, you came up with yesterday x equals negative three, x equals 1.5, and angel, as angel just said, x equals negative six. And these answers are certainly true enough, and that is definitely a correct answer. But? but I also introduced that there were a couple other things here. What else does x equal? Negative six. six. And x equals negative six. And what we said, it, how did we articulate this? Yeah, we say our zero is x, so zero. No. We said zero of, of whose value is six with multiplicity is equal to three. And we said that the reason that occurs is because this x plus six is actually x plus six three times. Okay, so we kind of introduced that yesterday, Kenzie, when you were gone. Uh, yeah, good. Hannah came up and worked a problem on the video. That was really good. And other people in the class did really great too. I don't want. I don't want to discount. I don't want to do any. Uh, I don't want to diminish any contributions from the class. So what I can do for for that is I can I can I don't know what I can do much about the temperature, but I can do a little bit about the airflow. Did you just say it's breathing? What about max speed? Uh, put it on. A, put it on a low speed. Hey. Okay. So that's probably the best I can do right now. All right, so what we're going to talk about today is roots, zeros, and multiplicities. And for most of this presentation here, I want you just to watch and, and pay attention. And we'll just, we'll just talk about it. But I'm going to have you take notes at certain points of certain key things. So otherwise, I want you just to be open-minded about what's happening here. So you're going to tell us what is that you? Yes, I'll tell you when, when you should write something down. Is it you? That, that is me, uh, and that is my son. Yeah, I would. So that was, uh, that was quite some time ago. I think it was in 2012, was it? Yeah. Anyway, we went out to, went out to California. <coughs> multiplicity. We're going to talk about multiplicity. And one thing that I did when I was started to teach pre-calculus, this whole thing of multiplicity kind of struck me strangely. And so uh, some of you remembered what I did. I went into a Burger King and what did I do? I ordered a Whopper Junior with a multiplicity. I said, I want a Whopper Junior, I want four of these. I want a Whopper Junior with a multiplicity of four. I don't see cheese on that. No, I didn't want them with cheese, okay? So that's, that's the way I wanted them, Carmen. I didn't want them with cheese, but thanks for noticing. And what did the order taker do when I asked for Whopper Junior for multiplicity of four? What does that mean? Well, kind of, not, not exactly that, but, but she kind of looked at me quizzically for a bit, but then she figured out, oh, you want four Whopper Juniors. Yeah, exactly. And the reason I bring that up today is because the word multiplicity might seem like it's a word that's a long word with a lot of syllables to confound you and all that, but really it's what the it's what my waitress or my order taker said, right? 
oh, you want four of them. So it's, there's four of them is, is what multiplicity of four means. So it's not that complicated. And we're going to examine what multiplicity of roots is. Now, if we have a linear function, a linear function will cross the x-axis at how many places? One place, right? Just like this one right here. We have a root or zero at x equals, I don't know, about two. And we say this zero has a multiplicity of one. And now we have this quadratic function, this upward opening parabola, and we say that each, this has two roots or zeros, We have two roots or zeros, and each of these roots or zeros has a multiplicity of one. Okay? And if we take this function here, whose graph is represented by this parabola, and separate this graph into two factors, and factor, that's what we, one of the things we did yesterday, factor, uh, found, found the factors. We have the factors of x plus 8 and x plus 2 and write these as separate functions and we graph these functions where do the graphs of these functions cross the x-axis? Right here. So these are the factors are going to be at quantity x plus 8, quantity x plus 2 because it turns out the value of the zero is zeros are related to these x-intercepts of negative 8 and negative 2. All right? Um, and so here's a big concept, and this is what I want you to write down, this thing right here. Big concept. I'm boxing in what I want you to write. The roots or zeros of polynomial function. Kayla, you have your notebook? No. I'll just watch the video off of it. Okay. Are composed of the roots and zeros of each linear factor of a quadratic function. And so that kind of ties into the reason behind the quick review exercise we did yesterday. Remember we said separate these polynomials into linear factors? That's what we're doing right here, linear factors. Okay? Okay, if uh, say so each has a multiplicity of each of zero has a multiplicity of one, and let's say we took that same function here, x squared plus 10x plus 16, and added nine to this equation. What would what would we get? Well, what we would get is x squared plus 10x plus 25. Now, can we find the factors of x squared plus 10x plus 25? What, are the, what is this in factored form? So Angel says that this is equivalent to quantity x plus 5 squared. Okay. In that, he is 
I think 100% right. So we are we're touching the x-axis. And how many x-intercepts do we have? We have one x-intercept. But, and that x-intercept occurs at negative 5, x equals negative 5. And as Angel did, we find the factors. We get quantity x plus 5 times quantity x plus 5. And what this represents is a double root or a double zero. And so what we say is that this root or zero of negative five has a multiplicity of two. two. So this is what a multiplicity of two zero looks like. Comes down as a parabola, touches the x-axis, goes up the other way, or could come up from the bottom and touch and go down. That's what it looks like. So uh, there it is in factored form, as Angel said. So the, the basic way that we're going to talk about first, and we've already started talking about this, is how to find roots and their multiplicities graphically. And so basically we're just going to look at a graph and just how does it look what is it based on the evidence of what we see with our own eyes? So we take, uh, whenever the graph touches the x-axis, that point represents at least one root of a polynomial function. A curve or line that goes straight through the x-axis represents a root or zero with a multiplicity of one. In fact, I think that might be worthy of a note-taking aside. What song is being played? One Man Band. What is it? One Man Band. One Man Band? I haven't even heard of it. Here's what happens is that um, the camera, the audio may pick it up So what would happen is that it could be the deal where it could be ad revenue for the writer of that song. Now we're not talking about probably what's going to be a hugely popular, popular video, but still. This line or any line that, that is a function with a slope greater than zero has a root or zero and the value of the root is the x-coordinate of a point where the graph touches the x-axis and the value of this root in this instance is negative six. Okay, let's go on here and get one of these pins here. Okay, now this one here, we have a downward sloping parabola, and each zero or root has a multiplicity of one in this case. Now, now we have this, this function here, starts low, ends high, but we say that this function has three real roots or zeros, each with a multiplicity of one. Welcome to room 15 where learning comes first. Okay, good, I will tell her to visit. Okay. So each of these real roots or zeros has a multiplicity of one. And 
and the value of these zeros are in set notation negative 3 comma negative 1 and 1. And next we have this W shaped graph here and how many real roots do we have here? Four. We have four. And here, here it is with a, with a screenshot of a calculator view screen. And we see this function here and the shape of the function. And that's, that's what it looks like. Now, one thing I want to do is I want you to take notes here on this. The fundamental theorem of algebra. This is the fundamental theorem of algebra right here. And this theorem here is what you could, uh, yeah, okay, let's take a picture of it. The uh, a polynomial function of degree n has n complex zeros, and complex being real plus non real zeros, and says some of the zeros may be repeated. And this is one of the things that on my tests, I'm going to have a question or two that test your understanding of the fundamental theorem of algebra. Usually when you talk about fundamental theorem of something, you think that that's the most important thing. I don't know that this is the most important thing about algebra, but that's what it's called. And we're going, to get, we're going to go over some examples of this too. And you'll see instances of, of how to find what they are. Okay. Any, any questions on this right now before we move on? Yeah, fundamental theorem of algebra, we talked about that. And in this case, we had we have this x to the fourth power, so it's the degree of four, and they're all real roots. Remember we talked at the beginning of this unit two, we talked about, we had those functions and said, is this a polynomial function or not a polynomial function? Remember that? That's what this is related to, it's partially why we're doing this now. And these are all real roots because we can see where they touch or cross the x-axis. And that's graphical evidence of it. 115 must be popular this afternoon. Okay, all right, I will send it. I'm next, right? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> okay. All right. Graphically. On accident? On what? Yes, on accident, Kaylee. Oh, you never know. On what? I poured coffee. Like scalding coffee. Oh, yeah. Scalding coffee. Don't put I did that and that made it worse. You don't put ice on it. Put mustard on it. Put mustard on it? Just put rice on it. I think ice was the right thing. Did you put ice on it right after you did it? No, but I hold it under cold water. Well, that's good too. Ever since then, it's been hurting worse. No, but that, but that was a good move. That was a good move because because you're taking away heat with that cold water. All right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It does. All right. We're back. Let's bring it back here. Okay. You know. All right. Graphically, the curved polynomial function that touches the axis at one point without crossing 
represents a double root or a root with a multiplicity of two. So basically what it is, if you have a parabola, if what looks like a parabola, and you're pretty sure it's a parabola, that just touches the x-axis and bounces off, that represents a zero with a multiplicity of two. two. Okay, so graphically looking at it, that's what it looks like. And here we have the value of this zero, in this case is four, with a multiplicity of two. And this will be a screenshot of a calculator view screen. And we can see, in this case, a double root at x equals three. Now, do you see what this is here? You see our function? Quantity x plus three squared. So that's what it looks like. Now, Did you take a, did I have you take a note on that yet? Yes. Uh, no, 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 no. I want you to take a note on this one right here. The curve of a polynomial function that touches the x at one point without crossing the x-axis represents a double root. Do you want to start that too? Yes, uh, this right here. And, and that's, I want you to write that statement there, but then I, after, I, after you write the statement, I'm going to qualify that statement a little bit, too. Didn't you do it last year? Does the does the fan help out the air in the room a little it's bit? A lot it's it just moves the air. Yeah, it's a little, it feels a little cool to me too. I notice the ones who feel better are the ones that are wearing sweatshirts. Okay. You feel a little, you're a little sleepy right now? Man, you guys are good because... I'm always tired, so... Yeah, after... Especially like after lunch and everything. Yeah. How you guys get through afternoons sometimes, I don't know how you do it, but... I take it two hour and a half every time I get home. Oh, do you? It helps you get through the day, okay. Well, here, here we have this cubic function coming down and touching the x-axis at x equals negative five and coming up again and touching again the x-axis at x equals negative one. And so these would be our, our multiplicities and values of those zeros. So I ask you, go ahead, what's your question? Your question? If the whole thing is a big parabola, like just one section has to make it work to have a multiplicity of two. Okay, uh, what Emily's asking, if he didn't, she said, even if the whole thing is not a parabola, it's, it's one section, and because it's part of a cubic function, we can't really call this exactly a parabola, can we? But it's very parabolish, isn't it, as it hits the x-axis right there. So right, the closer you look to where it actually hits, the more it exactly looks like a parabola. But you can see the farther we get away, from it, it it's, that's not as true. So that was actually a very good question. So it's not a parabola, but it looks like a piece of a parabola that you can just plunk right there. Okay, so next, uh, we have this graph here, and this is a standard form. 
Now the factored form, which we don't have here, would be very easy to figure. In fact, I'm going to write this function in factored form, if I can. If factored form is going to be x minus 1, and then 1, 2, 3, 4, x minus 4 squared. How did I know that this was the factored form of this? Uh, yeah, you look where it crosses and the nature of what happens where it crosses. Yes, Adam, you're right. And so we went straight through here at 1, so we knew this was a multiplicity of 1, and then this one bounced here, so we know this is a multiplicity of 2. Okay, so we're going to do that kind of analysis to figure out what's happening there. And then here we have uh, another graph that's much like the last one, except it's shifted up a little bit. So we have a single root with a multiplicity of 1, but and, and we have the value of that root right here at about 0.9896. And so we come back to the fundamental theorem of algebra. The roots, real and non-real, are equal to the degree of the polynomial function. What is the degree of this function? What is the degree of the function? The degree is, someone said three over here, right? Yes, okay. Degree is three, but how many roots or zeros do we see here? One. So what do we know, what is the total number of roots and zeros of real and non-real of this function by the definition of fundamental theorem of algebra? What is the total number of roots or zeros? is 3 by the fundamental theorem of algebra and we know that this is a this is a single root with a multiplicity of 1 so how many non-real zeros do we have here 2 2 okay so this is something that make a note of that we're going to revisit it but this is one thing i think on a test pretty soon you're going to have a question that looks almost exactly like that okay here we have another function, this time in factored form, where we have a 0 of 0, a 0 of negative 2, and a double root of 1. And so that's what the thing looks like. And back to Emily's really keen observation, does this thing here, as it touches the x-axis, look like a parabola? Yeah. Yeah. A little bit, right? A little bit. It has that smooth curve and it's going to look more like a parabola the closer we zoom in on it. So when it bounces, it has multiplicity too. Yeah, and that's a qual and I want to qualify that because it could be a different number than that, but it has to be at least two. I'm going to explain very briefly. You'll hear that. So here we have one with a multiplicity of two, zero with multiplicity of with it has a multiplicity of one, and then negative two with a multiplicity of one. And now we have this one right here, and that's the graph of it. We see that we have the zeros. We have negative 3 with a multiplicity of 2. We have 0 with a multiplicity of 2. And the curve of a polynomial functions that touch the x-axis while horizontal has a root with a multiplicity of 3, or even a higher odd-numbered multiplicity. So if you graph the, the equation like y equals x cubed, what happens is the thing comes up here right to the x-axis. And then instead of, instead of going down like a parabola would, the thing just kind of goes up just at an instant horizontal to the x-axis and then crosses. This is what a multiplicity of 3 looks like or it could be a higher odd-numbered multiplicity. And I'm going to give you examples of them right now. Uh, this is a third-degree polynomial function right here. And then this one right here, and we can see that we go up, it looks like it's going to bounce, but this 
crosses and continues. And now this one right here to the left in red, this is a fifth example of a fifth degree polynomial function. Does the thing also touch and cross? Yes. How does it look different though? Does it look any different? Okay, hold on to that thought. I'm going to ask you another question again. So, functions both horizontal and x-axis. And now to the right here, I bring in the graph of a seventh degree polynomial function that looks like this. So it's longer on the x-axis? Pardon me? Is it longer on the x-axis? Yeah, it, it seems to smash flatter against the x-axis. So that's how it is. But you can kind of see the evolution here, can't you? Third degree. And here it's, you can see the thing smashed a little bit. And now you can definitely see it to the seventh power. So that's just something to look out for. But usually, usually the, when you see the thing do this, this jiggle, usually it's going to be three unless you know that it's higher than that for some reason. And, uh, and here's an example of, of one with degree three. You have, you have a root equal to five at multiplicity of one. And then we have the root uh, x equals three with multiplicity of three. That's what it looks like. And now what we have here is this one, quantity x plus three to the fourth power. Does this look like a parabola? Yeah. It does. But here we have x to the sixth. Does this look like a parabola? Yeah. Does it look exactly like a parabola? Yeah. No, it doesn't. And how does it, how's it different? It's wider. Well, it's wider, but the thing, a parabola would look more like this, right? More of a smoother curve like this. It wouldn't be as cornery. It touches the x-axis. Yeah, it touches the x-axis. Now, now, it doesn't actually touch the x-axis, but it gets close enough to the x-axis that it looks like it touches the x-axis. It's still going to only touch the, exactly touch the x-axis at x equals 7 in this case. But it's going to be very close to the x-axis for quite an expanse on either side. So, uh, so you remember when I had you take notes of when I said if it's a multiplicity, if, if the thing bounces, it's a multiplicity of 0 with a multiplicity of 2? Yes. Well, the correction, the qualification should be, it could actually be 2 or an even greater number of even numbered multiplicity, right? But I think you can figure that out. And now we come to algebraically. So we're going to conclude with algebraically today, and we're found by analyzing the function. And here's the big concept for that, and this is it. Any linear factor of a polynomial function whose value can equal zero represents a real root or zero of a polynomial function. So I want you to write that down, please. And really, algebraically at this point, this is where we're talking about problems 7 through 10 that we did yesterday. Remember we, we had to solve these equations mentally? This is what we're talking about right here. So basically learning Part, what'd you say? Basically learning the logic behind it. Yeah, that's right. Exactly right. We learned the logic behind it. So... Wait, wait. Thank you. Now here, 
if we have this f of x equals quantity x plus x minus 1 times quantity x plus 5, how can we find the zeros of this function here? Yes, Angel said make this equal to zero. So we're going to use the zero factor property. And what is the zero factor property? Any number times zero equals zero. We talked about that yesterday. And so as Angel says, we can take either factor and set those factors, both of them in this case, equal to zero. So we have x equals one and then x equals negative five. And as it happens, this is one where we did the exercise in solving these mentally. Usually if you get the thing in factored form, it's a mentally very doable situation. You just look at it and say, oh, that's what it is. And you can write them down. So that's, uh, that's exactly right. And in this case, we have the roots are, or zeros are one with a multiplicity of one and negative five with a multiplicity of one. And we can visualize, I hope you can visualize what that would look like graphed. That you would have a, you'd have a zero, you'd have zeros at one and at negative five. And one, and that you'd have this looking thing here, okay? So I hope you can mentally visualize what that is, seeing a factored form of an equation like that. And then we have this, how would we find the zero for this one? G of x equals 2x plus 3. What would we do to find the zero of it? That angel said. Yes, thank you, Emily. So Emily said this time, right? So we're going to set it equal to zero. So we set it equal to zero, we go ahead and solve we get x equals negative 3 over 2. And the concept is, the, the concept here is this. Here's another concept. Any polynomial function with an odd number degree will have at least one real root or zero. What theorem, what theorem tells you that any polynomial function with odd number degree will have at least one real root or zero? What theorem? I probably didn't tell you. No, no. I probably haven't told you yet. It's one we usually bring up the calculus, but it's actually in the pre-calculus book. It's called the intermediate value theorem. You see where it says odd? odd, right, at least one real zero, intermediate value theorem, at least one real zero, real zero intermediate value theorem. So we got to have, if we have an odd degree function, we got to have at least one real zero. Now for an even number, for an even degree function, do we need to have a real zero? No, we don't. So, uh, yeah, we are, I think we're about to the end, and I'm going to see where this thing takes us next, and we're just going to call it. So, yeah, that's a good, good stopping point for us today. Thank you for, for uh, 